Uh, well, uh, I may have mentioned this before in my last interview, so to speak, that uh, a profound statement by someone who is anonymous, which uh, we have on a, a uh, plant ball out in the corner of the patio, where it says it's it's uh, it's not the the uh, moments. T uh, t your life is not measured by the the moments that you breathe, but by the how they go by the um, by the moments that take your breath away. Something, something like that. I'm not good at paraphrasing or whatever. And that experience with Baba just, I mean, it, it was so astounding. It just, it, it was a total change of life that I didn't even realize was going to happen at the time. And uh, so we're talking 1972, the last day of March. And after, after the experience I had uh, in LaGuardia Airport, a vision, you can call it, um, and ended up in San Francisco at, at, on, on the end of the flight. I, I stayed in, in the Bay Area for a day or two and then drove back to Scottsdale, Arizona, where my wife and family were, were, were waiting, waiting to meet me, wondering what, what had happened. And I, when I walked in the door, all I could say is uh, to my wife and kids, well, God is alive and well. That was, that was the extent of my dealing with it, as far as they were concerned. And she didn't uh, question it or did, didn't say anything. She didn't want to discuss it. And uh, I never gave it a thought that, that that was something that I should have pursued. But in any case, the time went by, and uh, I went back to work, and um, well, I wouldn't call it going back to work, but uh, just I had been, been given uh, gratis to do what I wanted, when I wanted, for however long I wanted. Um, one morning in, in uh, oh, it was in the, in the end, end of, yeah, it was the middle of October, roughly. And uh, I all of a sudden, it was a Sunday morning too, I just kind of leapt, got up in bed. I didn't jump, get out of bed, I just kind of stood up, stood up in bed, <laughs> in a sense. Sat up in bed, I don't know. And said, I'm going to India. And went back to sleep and woke up in, about a half hour later and put on my clothes and I drove down to uh, down to Scottsdale Road, which is about a quarter of a mile, half a mile away, just to see where the travel agency was. Strangely enough, I mean, it, it, uh, so uh, I did that and I was driving by and I said, I think just stop in and see what, what's going on. Maybe I have something in the window. I had no idea what was going to happen, but I knew I was going to India. And when I got, when I got out of the car and I walked over to the, to the travel agency, um, it was just a bill, it was like a strip mall. And uh, I noticed somebody in there, although the door was locked, and I knocked on the door. And this lady came out she opened the door and says, can I help you? I said, uh, uh, I, uh, you're, uh, are you open or closed? She says, oh, um, no, I've just been cleaning up and all that stuff, And but is there any possibility of, of, of purchasing a plane ticket today? I said, oh, c come on in. You know, she was a single owner of the business, obviously, and she had just moved out from New York, and she was very Jewish. <laughs> Come on, and I and she said, "Well, where do you want to go?" And she says, "I said uh, I'd like to get a, 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 a round trip to India." And she kind of looked at me for about two or three seconds. Oh! And she reached into the garbage pail and pulled out 
a, a um, special from, from uh, Air India uh, to, uh, you know, from JFK to, to, um, to Bombay and back, including Phoenix to New York. And the whole thing was $770. So I just took out my checkbook and wrote her a check, and she was very happy, and it was the last time I ever saw her. So I went to India, and uh, that, that in itself was an experience that uh, unforgettable from, from the moment I landed to the moment I got back, you know, left India. And uh, when I got off the airplane, uh, it was one of those big, huge, huge ones at the time, um, there was hardly anybody on it, and uh, so I was able to just stretch and sleep whenever I wanted. And I, I remember that the aroma, I use that word gently, <laughs> the aroma of India was very, it was very stagnant. And uh, even today, it's, it's, it, even though they built a whole new airport in, in Mumbai, that essence of India still remains in my, in my sense, sensory perceptions. And I, I stepped out to the outer portion of the airport, and right in front of me, there's this huge, huge collection of what I found out later was over 100,000 people living in little tin huts. Uh, you know, that stretched as far as you could see. And I said, my God, I mean, what is this? So I got a, I got a taxi and I stayed for three days just to sightsee, if you want to call it that. Not much, but uh, I, got, I, rented, I rented a room in some, some buddy's little hotel or whatever, and the taxi driver stayed with me for a couple of days, or all that. And uh, funny, th what happened then is uh, the day I was to leave, I, uh, I found out that, that, the, uh, that I could get a ticket for, for uh, uh, 7.30, yeah, 7.30 uh, train ticket. I had no idea that at the time or even thought of taking a plane to Pune and then going from Pune to, to Mirabad. But, uh, uh, they, and I found out that taxi drivers are not allowed inside the hotel. So even though I had made arrangements for the taxi driver, please pick me up at 6.15 or whatever time to get me to Victoria Station. And I woke up. I slept, I must have slept half the day, uh, just from the jet lag. And I rushed downstairs, threw everything in my, my suitcase. I had a carry-on and a small bag, over-the-shoulder carry-on. And when I came down, the guy was very lackadaisical about helping me out. He brings out all these papers. I was, I says, I, I pushed them aside, reached in my pocket, put, I pulled out 15 bucks, and I put it on, the, and I was out the door. <laughs> and so we got to the, we got to Victoria Station, and uh, out comes this this uh, porter, dressed in a suit right out right out of the movie with Cary Grant and uh, Victor McLaglen. What was the name of it? Uh, I don't know, about, about uh, fighting during the Second World War in India. And uh, he had a little brown suit and a little thing on his head. And he, was just, he must have been 80 years old, <laughs> but, he, but he just bounced up to the, took my bag. And we got to the station. I mean, I got inside the Victoria Station and found out that the train was just, just leaving. I, was, I just missed it by five, five or ten minutes. So I rushed back out, and the, the, the guy was still waiting, who took my bags in, was still waiting, 
And he picked all my bags up and brought me down back to the taxi cab was still there. And I got in the taxi cab and I said, get me to, to um, Dadar. Dadar was the first stop on this flight, on this uh, train. And uh, by that time it was dark. And we're rushing through Bombay to get to Dadar. And we get to, get to as we're pulling into the Dadar, the, plane, the train was pulling out. <laughs> And he turned around to me and he says, well, what do you want to do now? I says, let's go back to Victoria Station. So we drove back down to Victoria Station. And I got out you know, got all the stuff. That particular porter was gone by that time. And uh, found out that I, uh, I could get an 8.30 train to, uh, to uh, Pune. Yeah, to Pune. And uh, so... I'm waiting on line, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm, move, I'm gradually moving up, and by the time I was about maybe two people away, which, were, which got their, those people got their tickets, uh, all of a sudden everybody just crammed into the, in, into the, in front of the, t the ticket teller there, and I shouted out, uh, get the mm, out of my way, and the, <laughs> the seat parted. <laughs> And I got my ticket, I got my bags, and I just stepped on the train as it was starting to pull out. Mm. And I got this little little third class metal seat next to a window uh, and found out that I was on a milk run. So it took eight and a half hours for me to go from from Mumbai, Bombay to Pune. It was just it just kept stopping. And I had one guy sleeping on my thigh, his head bursting against my thigh, and another guy was sleeping on my foot. And that's how I, that's how I got to, so it was five o'clock in the morning. And we finally got there, five o'clock in the morning, five fifteen, whatever. I got off the wrong side of the tracks. I was trying to find out, I was going to go to the Amir, that's where I was told the, the hotel to go and uh, uh, to look up Jal when I got there, Baba's brother, younger brother. And, uh, as, uh, and I got lost. And I probably walked in circles, and uh, finally I started walking back towards what I felt was the train station. I was going to get back there and then get my bearings right. And I started walking along this nicely clean street, and I came across a house uh, It was sitting in, 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 in a compound type. It was the only house and it was surrounded by a white picket fence all the way around the house. It was a huge compound. And the front, front of the house was facing the way I was walking. I was on, that, on the side of the street of the house. And I'm walking along and I turn around and there's a man, uh, an elderly, Indian gentleman. He was in, in his chair reading, reading the morning paper, and without looking up, he said, Mayor Baba is that way. And I, in my, what did you say, honeymoon state still, <laughs> or whatever, wherever my mind was, didn't give it a second thought. And I just kind of nodded at him, even though he wasn't looking at me. And I walked across the street and made a turn, and as I made a turn, Another gentleman came up in a, in a pundit's dress, a little, little grayish, with a Swaraj gray hat, and he walked right up to me and uh, said, I'll take you to the railroad station, and he picked up my bag and took, the, took my uh, one over my shoulder out of, out of, off me, and he said, follow me, and he walks me right up to the station. They said, the Amir Hotel is on the other side. I hadn't talked to these people. I hadn't said a word to them. And so I went to the Amir and I sat down and I had, I had to ask for some tea, some chai, and they brought chai over and I was sipping the chai. Chai bounces into the, <laughs> into the place and he sits right down next to me and we spent three wonderful days in Pune showing me all around Baba's house and the place where he banged his head and the, and the, and the uh, zoo where he fed the elephants and all, all, the, all the things you hear about Jal and how we, you know, yeah, 
this. So anyway, the next thing was to get to Maribyrne. So I stayed, I stayed in there for two nights and three days, yeah. And again, I'm without the ability to figure out how and where and when and, you know, to go. But I did end up in the bus station. And uh, I was, uh, so uh, I asked two, I asked, I, I asked the guy that sells the tickets and he dismissed me out of sight. And finally I saw this other gentleman who looked respectable enough and, and to, uh, to feel okay about asking him uh, which bus goes to, uh, uh, to Ahmed Nagar. And he says, well, you see that empty, empty space? You just stand over there. When that bus comes in and, and, and what's the word, uh, empties of its occupants, you get on that bus and that'll take you all the way down the mountain. I said, thank you, sir. So, by the time it came, there was a huge amount of people waiting to get on that bus, which was about 45 minutes later. So I crawled in the back open window and <laughs> I was so tired, I just laid across the back seat, which is, and nobody bothered me the whole trip. But uh, I had to pay the price for that because the driver of the bus, when we stopped at a, at, at, uh, a P stop, he backed the bus in as far as he could <laughs> to the latrines. <laughs> and I, I, woke, I woke up with this stench of, a century of urine, I guess. Uh, crazy. And uh, so, got to McNagher, the bus stop, um, got a rickshaw to the trust office. Um, and uh, I found out where, um, who to go to. They said, go see Adi. Hey, Ronnie, uh, he'll tell you what to do. I said, thank you. So I walked over to Adi's office in Kushu quarters there, and uh, uh, when I stepped inside the door, he said, uh, uh, he looked at me and he says, who are you? I said, I'm, I'm Jack Burke. And then he said, uh, do you have a reservation? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> so he immediately picked up the phone and said, and made the boop, 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 boop. Sarosh, we got another one. <laughs> and hung up the phone, and five minutes later, Sarosh comes up with his car and takes me out to Beelow's Villa at that. And uh, I'm sitting on the couch, there's a few other pilgrims there, a woman named Marion Hodgkin, Hodgins, Hodgkins or Hopkins or whatever from Atlanta. Um, Fred McNutt and his wife were staying there, and two or three other people I don't even know, remember. And uh, just having having a cup of chai from Raju, who's Vila's uh, gopher. And uh, I was there about a, a 45 minutes, and Sarosh came in and started to talk, and before uh, he could say a word. Vila came came over to me and said, "You, you get in there. Go to bed." And she led me into the middle room of Villa's villa there. And uh, when I when I woke up or came to, I went out to there. They had a little um, had a little cabana. Uh, not a, where is it? Uh, gazebo. A gazebo. Yeah, off to the right side of the house and this woman from Atlanta was in there and she said and I sat down with her and said uh, yeah what time do you have she looked at me and says you know you've been unconscious for three days mm -hmm. I said really <laughs> yeah I had actually gone I got I remember it in the fog waking up once and going out because Sarosh was giving a talk to, the, to everybody who was there. And I sat down and I got up and went back. So that was the only time in those three days. It was three, yeah, three days. So it was a combination of this, uh, well, it was, it, was the, it was almost the end of 
everything Baba wanted to do with me, in the sense of for that particular time, short time period of, of a year. Uh, the, the, those, those of you who first or who are first coming to Baba that may be watching this particular video, uh, the only thing I can ask you to do is just have patience and let it flow <laughs> because you have no idea what's going to happen. And I went, I decided to, with two or three other guys, to go to Maribad and stay overnight because it's a samadhi, obviously. And uh, so that came about, and at that time you couldn't, you couldn't uh, bring food. Uh, and women weren't allowed to stay overnight, uh, if guys were, and because they had just double bunk bed, double iron bunk beds, quite uncomfortable, but you, you don't really care. And uh, so the, the, the first morning, yeah, I didn't go to the Samadhi until the first, the first, uh, stayed the first night and I didn't rush it. I just, just took, I was at, I don't know what space I was in, but I do remember there was maybe five, five to eight people up at the Samadhi at that particular time. And I, uh, as I was approaching the, the threshold for the very first time, I. I remember stepping up on it. Today you can't, they say well, you wear it out or whatever, you, everyone steps over it. But back then, we did, we just normally, because it was approximately this high. And Westerners are not used to stepping over things anyway. And uh, I put my second, my left foot second, so I'm standing ready to step down or continue going, and uh, I was stopped in my tracks, literally stopped in my tracks, and uh, Baba took the inside of my emotions and just pulled them right up through, through, and I just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried for however long, 30 seconds, three minutes, four minutes, I have no idea the time. It just this huge, amount of, of emotional sobs that uh, it was it, it wasn't it wasn't conditioned uh, of being sad or happy it was just emptied out I was just emptied out and uh, I turned I didn't go into I didn't go any further I just turned around and walked out and sat down outside and after five or ten minutes, I get up and I said, uh, apologized to, to the people that were in there uh, for my actions, and they said, what are you talking about? Uh, and I, not that I realized then, but nobody, nobody experienced what I was going through. And uh, so everything just kind of flowed along naturally. I found out later from uh, Dick, Dick uh, Anthony, that the same the same situation had happened to him. Uh, he's a lives in San Francisco in Berkeley, rather, uh, and where he was rolling around the floor. I mean, uh, the the atrium uh, for a couple of minutes, and when he finally got up and sat down after it was over, uh, nobody saw him do it. So Baba has that way of stopping time for everybody else and what you go through, you go through. Uh, so anyway, from there, I had a very lovely time in, in, in India. Uh, spent most of it traveling around to Laura and to Sikori and to Shirdi and do, doing the, the pilgrim shuffle, so to speak. Um, met the Mandali for the first time. Went out to, I remember going, I remember uh, actually going going from Beelersville out, out to, out to Mirazad uh, by myself and getting off the bus and, and walking that whole um, alleyway, so to speak, 
into Marizan property. And, and standing in front of the old gate, this is 1972, the old gate, quite different than what it is today. And see, all the monthly, just, you know, it's eight or nine, ten maybe, uh, over in front of Mondeley Hall. It must have just come out from Mondeley Hall. And uh, I turned around as I was walking, I just had this immense feeling that these were all my aunts and uncles. Um, there was no Indian, American, Irish, Jewish, whatever, discriminatory. They were just like my aunts and uncles. And I, I uh, attached myself to Monty. Uh, she seemed to be the type of individual that you could. And she, she welcomed it. And uh, going away, uh, she gave me some of the treasures when I was leaving. So I got back to America. And the first thing I got, I, I got confronted with uh, was my wife saying she would like me to leave. And I said, nah, not now, not now, a month or two, you know. Not that I, not that I, I, I didn't care, let's put it that way. I, I just was voicing my heart, you know, I, I don't want to leave. So finally I did, you know, she get, became a little more persistent. And I, I remember um, as part of this whole experience, which is still ongoing obviously, I, I rented a, 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 a single-only apartments that were down on Camelback Road on the way into, into Phoenix from Scottsdale. And uh, unbeknownst to my wife at the time and unbeknownst to me, I would get up every morning and I'd go and uh, take my briefcase and two-piece suit and all that jazz, and i go to the local coffee shop, which I think was either Coco's or Shoney's, I forget, on Camelback. And I, I would pick up the newspaper and I'd order my coffee in Danish. And I'd sit there and I'd, I'd used to scan the newspaper, especially the sports. And uh, now, it's hard to realize this, but from Monday to Friday for practically nine months, I would cry to the point where uh, I, I mean, I initially, first four or five days was embarrassed, but I couldn't stop it. I would just sit there and I'd put the paper from my place and the tears would just flow. This. And Marge, Marge uh, told me that's what Monty called melting, is the word that she used for describing that, that feeling. And that happened to me. It was. A, It, it, to me, it, it wasn't a, a question of wondering why. You just did it. It just happened to you, and you couldn't stop it. So, uh, in between that that time where that was going on, uh, my wife at the time came over one Wednesday or Thursday, and uh, she came into the into the apartment, and she said, "Oh, I'd like to talk about us reconciling." And I said, oh, I'd love to do that, but the, the, I, I'm just not ready to do it during the week. Saturday would be perfect. Why don't you come over Saturday morning and we can work this out, whatever, whatever it is we can do. Um, she was a little, little disappointed in my rejection of her attempt at that particular time. I guess, I mean, I can assume that that was the case. And she turned around and as she was walking out, uh, the, I had a picture of Baba on the, on the left of the wall and the door opened this way on the right side. And she opened it up and she turned around uh, this way here and then she turned around the other way and she looked at me and she said, well, in any case, it's either him or me. And I said, lady, they ain't no choice. And that was the end of the marriage, literally. 
Um, we worked out the divorce arrangements and all that stuff, and I just came. I, I walked away from it with my backpack and a few books. And it was fine with me. You know, the townhouse and the cars and all that stuff. I didn't want any, I just, uh, the pain was too deep as far as the kids were concerned, because I had three kids, three children. And, uh, I, and I was psychologically uh, and honestly unable to do anything. I couldn't work. Um, I, had, I had no, uh, I had no, no income coming in because I had, I had written the president of the company and I said, Matt, I can't, I can't accept can't accept this money from you because I was getting a check for 800 bucks a month a week rather just without even working there's an agreement that we had reached and uh, but I felt so guilty uh, that I'm taking money for nothing and, and, and no it's not it's not me and uh, and so I, I couldn't so she had enough selling the house and selling the one of the cars and all that. I, I don't know how she got about doing it, but she left. She she ended up uh, going to, to live in, in uh, the Bay Area through the, the grace of her sister, her older sister, her husband. Because I had I had I uh, had from my heart I asked Bobby, they're your kids now. You take care of them. I can't. And, they survived. I mean, things got okay. Um, it's still kids and I are still estranged a bit. And uh, so I got here. here I am uh, leaving the apartment because no money was coming in. So I was basically had gotten into into the the hopelessness phase of this experience. <laughs> and uh, I called a friend of mine, talked to a friend of mine, uh, a retired lieutenant colonel, who was a, a very much into, into theosophy and all that stuff. And he called another guy, and that guy called me up and arranged with me to, uh, he would he would he would uh, give me his couch to sleep on until I got on my, back on my feet, so to speak. If I would help him in his job, which was a janitorial service. Uh, so, um, from let's see, that was on a Friday that I vacated my apartment, and um, that Sunday. That Sunday night, I started to help, uh, what was his name? Yeah. I helped him in, in small offices, big offices, and one, one, of his, one of his accounts was the Jacqueline Health Studio in Phoenix. And uh, during the process of that, here I was literally naked in the shower, scrubbing down the walls with all the soap that had accumulated over the week or however long he did it, saying to Bob, what are you doing to me? What was this all about? <laughs> totally stripped of everything. And, uh, whatever. And um, the, the life continued on, and I, I just uh, did my best to, to stay alive. And, Having, having previously been in the Franciscan order, I was welcomed into, basically without question, to the uh, Franciscan, Franciscan retreat house in Paradise Valley. They have a Casa Ipaz EBN, and there's four or five Franciscan priests there and their helpers. And so whenever I wanted a meal, I just go over there and I try to take a bus or whatever to get there. And it was in that process, uh, about two years later, that I met my se second wife at the time when we had married the two kids. Um, fast forward to the end of that marriage for the very same reasons. Uh, they, they couldn't change their belief systems. I mean, the, they were so limited in that. Uh, although I must 
give my second wife credit for trying. It just, she was, it just, to lose that, that um, anchor that she had as far as being a Catholic is concerned was a little too much for her. And uh, I, I had to move out of Phoenix because the pain of, of being that close to two kids that I actually birthed at home uh, was too much to bear. I just, I just couldn't do it and I found myself wandering and ended up, I ended up in, in the Newport Beach area for a, a year and a half and um, at my cousin's house and my godmother's son, his wife and three kids. Uh, the day I, the Bob was incredible how, did, how he takes care of things. I got there on a Saturday afternoon, I uh, know it was a Friday, a Friday rather, and uh, Terry came home from work. He was the sales manager for IBM in, in Southern California. And uh, lived in a beautiful big house in Blue Key and Harborview Estates. And uh, welcomed me in. They were having dinners. And so she got up and both she and, and his wife, they were, they were married in the back room of my dad's saloon in New York City, you know, many years before. So I, I kind of knew them in that sense. I didn't feel uncomfortable about asking them, do you mind if I hang out here for the weekend and, and I'll be on my way? And so sure, sure. I was down, you know, blah, blah, blah. what's going on? Blah, blah, blah. And we got that whole thing straight, straightened out. And I got a room upstairs. The next day, he was gone. He was back down a big, big canyon with, the, with his mistress. And I, I, I became the, the surrogate husband, so to speak. <laughs> and she was getting her master's degree in marriage and counseling at the same time. And uh, the kids are teenagers, so it was, it was kind of really raucous in that regard. And he would come by once a month and, and check things out or pay some bills and he'd be gone again in an hour. And uh, she was, she was, and um, she cried when I finally left, and it took a year and a half. And, uh, and the, as I, I mentioned it was, uh, no, <coughs> a number of times, uh, I almost died for a broken heart. I mean, she, she used to come up and make sure that I was still alive, just peek in the room and see if I was still breathing. So I went through that incredible grief stage, which I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Um, but Bobby took care of me, you know. Um, I needed some money to, to get a move on. The guy next door asked me to paint his house. He paid me 1500 bucks. And I was on a plane to the Bay Area. I stayed for a couple of days with a friend of mine uh, from Phoenix who moved up there. Uh, so the software director for Apple. Um, and. Um, Moved to Berkeley, got involved with the Bob Group in Berkeley, and it was during that that time where um, we're talking 1979. No, we're talking 1980, 80, 80, 1981. Um, I've had it. I've had. Uh, I had maybe. One or two experiences where, where Bob had come into my life directly uh, between the time that I had the vision of him in, in the airport. And in this particular case, I was sitting, I was sitting in, in a duplex that I was renting. It was kind of a railroad flat, front room, middle room, kitchen, hallway, dining out, and bathroom, kitchen and bathroom. And I was sitting in the corner facing a fireplace, and on top of the fireplace in one afternoon, it was a, I had put up a, a paper photo about Ch Bob's Chase Studio. And I was reading a book, and uh, all of a sudden I put the book down, and I started really getting into verbally with Bob. I was just talking out loud. And, 
uh, telling him I feel stuck. What are, what's going on with my with me? What are you doing with me? What's my life doing? What, what all that stuff for 15, 20 minutes? I just ranted and raved and cried and shouted and screamed and cursed and did all that stuff. And I was so pooped, so I get up and went in and lay down in, in bed, and immediately went into dream. Just immediately. And I was back in the chair, reading a book. And I caught a, a, a blur out the window, because the, the, the living room, the area, the front room was a little higher uh, than, than the steps. You had to go up the steps to a couple of, and then make a you know, doorway. And uh, I said, well, you know, what's that? And I didn't pay attention to it. And then um, I got this knock on the door, real rap. <laughs> back to reading, and then a real bang, bang, bang. So I get up and in the way of being disturbed in my reading <laughs> and looked out the door. And all I could see was a, a group of men in in, in white Siraj hats and white and sadras and all that whatever uniform, and with no faces. And all of a sudden, the, the, the door disappeared, and I walked over to the fireplace and put my my elbow on the left end of the mantle and watched. This crowd come in, and, these, and they all walked around the room, and they're all pointing at the walls and going around and on and on. And they all went into, this, into the dining area and formed an arc around the dining room table. All the, all the furniture in the place belonged to the owner of the place next door. And uh, they, the same thing happened when women came in. Again, with different colored dresses and gray hair and black hair and all that stuff, all the dress. And they went through the same motions. And uh, they, formed a, they formed a circle in front, in front of the men. And they were all looking at the door. And I looked over the door, and there was Baba on the, on the threshold of the door. And he was really angry. <laughs> Uh, I can say angry enough where I felt that if I had the ability to do so, and I've said this a number of times, I would have went up the flue with a, up, the, up the chimney through the flue if I was able to. I got frightened. Uh, he, was, he was, his hands was on his hips, he had a big, thick black belt that looped around and down. I could literally, in, in the dream, count the, the little amount of holes in, in the belt. And he had a pair of, pair of his old, tready, you know, all the old sandals. And he just stood at that doorway and looked around the room quickly. I, I wasn't there as far as he was concerned. And when he finished the first of his head movements, he just looked at me and he flicked his chin at me. And I immediately was over on, on my knees, bowing down to him. And uh, at the same time, I'm back at the fireplace looking at this occurrence and uh, wondering what was going on. And he was looking, he was looking around, and he, was start, he started going, doing this signing thing. And then, uh, I no longer was at the fireplace, I was right there. And he poured his left hand down and slammed me into the ground. It just flattened my face. I went flat out with my face right on his, on the top of his foot, feet. And back, and back at the fireplace, and up in the ceiling, looking at myself at the fireplace and looking down there. So all this was going on. And he started signing again, and then he got up. Then, then he just let let go, and I was back by the fireplace. And uh, he was smiling, 
and I looked over there and all of Mondelez's faces came into view and they were all smiling and nodding and all that and, uh, and I woke up and I was sitting on the edge of my bed to, looking out the window. This is 80. Hmm. Actually, it was it was it was. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Erwin Luck sent out a, a uh, request to the Baba community for volunteers to work on Deshmukh's must film, the Avatar, which was eventually named the Avatar of the Age. And uh, I had gotten it, and I decided that, that I, I didn't have enough experience, if any at all, for, to, to work on a film. Although I was working with Liam Mullen on his hearts, you know, on the script to do um, Hearts on Fire about the Prem Ashram. And I've been working with Liam for a number of years on it, but it didn't seem to apply to this. So I threw it in the fireplace one. It must have been early spring when it was still cold. And uh, so the following, the following uh, fall, uh, I had taken everything in the middle room, the mahogany table and all the dining area, and switched it around to the living room. So I was sitting in that same chair again, but the chair now is facing out on the street in the, in the middle room. And, and and talking with the, uh, someone on the couch, I had the couch on, on my left, my left, and my good friend Jim Dow comes in, comes into the house at seven seven thirty in the evening, and sat down and started to listen listen to me, you know, for five or ten minutes. He looked at me. He says, Myrtle Beach, and I got the feeling in my back. Now, going back to back to the dream experience, I walked around Berkeley with my back going, just being electrified. My spine was just going up and down, up and down, up and down. It was like getting a shock that never ended. And for three days, I felt that morning, noon, and night, it was just there, and I got accustomed to it. I said, I don't know what's going on. I just live with it. It wasn't painful, it was just there. It was like someone behind me going bzzz, <laughs> one of those panic buttons. And uh, I got that feeling, just, just a quick one. And I said, yeah. So I ended up sitting down and, and writing a letter to Erwin. Now at the same time that I'm writing this letter, Baba's appearing to Erwin in a dream state, as he recalled to me later years later. And he had been complaining to Baba that he needed help. Why are people are coming here and they're leaving? They come and they leave, they come and they leave. Well, they don't know where it was. <laughs> and, uh, he said, okay, and said, I'll, I'm going to send you two monks. And of course, I was I didn't know this at the time, I, as I said in the previous talk, that I had spent four, four years, eight months, and two days as a Franciscan monk or a monk apprentice and then a monk. And uh, I wrote him back, and our letters literally crossed in the mail. <laughs> and uh, so the next thing I know, Wendell Bressman is knocking on my door, and basically calling me to, to meet him for lunch. He wanted to check me out and all that. So um, I was going with a, a a, a lady named Cynthia uh, Lebo. Her father was uh, one of the top ten ontologists in the world in San Francisco, Presbyterian Hospital, or wherever it is over there. Nice guy, but a very orthodox family, very orthodox. And she was a free spirit, and we were in love. And, but when it came to Baba, there was no choice again. And this was my, I left, and uh, you know things happen. Anyway, I'm 
chugging across the uh, the, the country in, in this '69 Ford van that was. Uh, well, that's another story. I'll tell you about that later. So I ended up uh, spending three years with Erwin and six days a week looking at Baba's photo coming across my vision all day long. I uh, never gave a second thought about it. It was a job to do and I did it. And I would literally feel Baba's presence behind me walking up and down, get it done, get it done, get it done. <laughs> so, um, I don't feel fortunate or unfortunate. It's sort of something that, that just happened. And, um, I feel grateful that I was in, in, uh, able to do that, and I hope I, I did a good enough job that pleased him, and that was the only thing that matters to me. So with that, I'll, I'll end my, my, my discussion. Get on with, get on with Baba's life. And, uh, to, to talk again next time I'm around. Thank you.